Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dalmar, and we're going to talk about the high holidays. And if you saw our previous show, we told about the basic ideas of the high holidays. Here we have a few chauffeurs. I'm not going to blow the chauffeur uh, right now. And we talked about what the chauffeur is, the ram's horn. But we want to talk about the deeper ideas or the Kabbalah. But we talked about Kabbalah before. There's Kabbalah about everything the deeper mystical ideas of everything in the world. And of course, I mean, Kabbalah is Jewish, so obviously they're going to talk about the deeper ideas, the deeper ideas of Rosh Hashanah and the chauffeur sound. Now, we said generally, I mean, just a very fast review of the basic idea of what a chauffeur is. Chauffeur is a ram's horn. It's the call to repent. The new year, you want to get your act together, you want to ask God for a good year, well, says, well, you're no good, why should, you know, it's like you go to the boss, and they, uh, you know, he says, hey, I'd like a raise, Ooh, a raise, well, you were absent here, you're absent there, you messed up on this project, well, why should I give you a raise, why should, I, maybe I'm thinking of firing you all together, he says, why should I give you better, so then, I mean, I don't know if it will work with the boss, but in any case, it works with God, that you're allowed to say you're sorry, and please, I'm going to try harder, I mean, maybe would with a few bosses. I don't know if everybody in any case, and that's why you want to say, all right, I'm sorry for the past, but I'm going to do better in the future, and God's nice. So he says, all right, all right, I'll take it. Hopefully he takes it, and they'll say, not only will I keep you around, I'll give you a better year. And the chauffeur is an alarm. So you should get your act together. Like I said, it's like a more of an ambulance alarm. Well, well what's happening? What's happening? I hear an alarm. Well, well, you know, obviously it gets everybody attention. So that's what the horn is. You blow a horn, and you get everybody's attention. But, all right, so that was the basic idea, making it very fast. I explained it more at length before. Now, uh, the chauffeur is straight, and it's not just a horn. Now, like I told you, all right, it's a horn, it's a sound, it's a sound. But um, it's more than that. That's where the Kabbalah comes in. And it's an expression of your heart, of your feelings. And here you have a straight horn. A lot of times they're curly cues a little bit. If you've seen pictures of them, I don't have to show you, but they're a very big curly cue horn. And in any case, we want a straight horn because it's like, people even say in English, straight from the heart, or you want to express your heart. And there are three sounds, we said, and that they are the straight sounds, ooh, the broken sound, ooh, 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 and the little bit of a staccato, da 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 all right, so these are the three expressions of your heart that's coming from your inner heart. And those are the, the ways to reach the inner heart because you have to understand this. I mean, again, Kabbalah is the spiritual ideas and making, a, again, a long story into a very brief idea. You know, you want to go spiritual places. You know, you want to go to Canada, get in the car, or go on a plane. You know, you know how to get there. Well, I want to get to a higher spiritual level. Show me a time machine. You know, that's science fiction. There's no time machine. And there's nothing to, you know, I don't know, car to the spiritualness. So how do you go anywhere? Obviously, you know, it's, it's a joke. There's nothing uh, physical that's going to get you to a spiritual place. What we got to do is go to a rocket ship and go over the sun. You can't go there anyway. Look, you can get to the moon or Mars nowadays so how are you going to the higher heavens what are you going to do there's no spaceship that's going to take you there anyway so what it is of course you don't need a spaceship so spaceship is physical and the moon is physical it's a rock or whatever it's it's and it's a distance a few hundred thousand miles so you go through a distance you can just get a a bigger engine i mean make it simple i mean a very complicated situation get a big engine and you, you fly up to the moon yes because it's a physical thing we're talking again about something spiritual. How do you reach your heart? How do you re reach your soul? Well, there's no operation. You know, obviously you don't hurt yourself. There's craziness. You don't hurt yourself, and you don't. Uh, there's nothing to, to uh, you know, look at it, a, a CAT scan to see your soul. But what you do is that's what these spiritual devices are for. The chauffeur. It's more than just a sound. I mean, on one basic level, it's a sound to get you nervous and scared. Hey, the day of judgment is coming. But on the other hand, that these sounds are expressions of your soul. That's what's so beautiful. You want to find your pathways into your soul, 
that's what these mitzvahs, these, that's what these commandments are all about. And these commandments reach up to a higher, higher level and that they reach into your soul into a very, very deep level also. And that's one thing, that's what the shofar does for you. It uh, deals with your soul, it, uh, it expresses your soul. So how does it do that? The, it's on a very deep level, in Kabbalah level. These are God's commandments, and that's what these special days are. Now, we have to remember also that days are also special. I mean, you can say, well, I can blow it in the middle of the summer, the horn, I'll get to my soul. No, it's got to be in the right time. It has to be done on Rosh Hashanah. Why, if the chauffeur's such an idea that it expresses your soul, why can't I do it any old day of the year? What does it make a difference? Well, that's a different issue of time. And time is very important, according to Kabbalah, because it reaches into the special time when the, the everything converges together, the first day of the year, which is, of course, the first day of the month. It's the month of Tishrei. Now, it's the time when the constellations are the scales, and that's why that the scales, and we are measured on the scale. And that's why we want to do the right thing. Again, I don't know if 50% uh, will get you a passing mark in high school or college. Probably won't, to say the least. But on the other hand, that again, God's merciful and he's kind, and therefore he allows a lower passing mark. 50-50, like a scale, 50-50 even. And therefore that a person will, re to reach to the scales, you want to have the best things that the, um, the you want to reach the merits. Now again, I'll tell you a little bit of a story. It's a beautiful story about how a person's merits, you don't know what's good or bad. It's, it's clearly, it says, you don't know the weight of what's, what's important or not. We just don't know. And I'm going to give you a, a beautiful story that they tell. There was this rich man, and of course, you expect a rich person should help out with tzedakah, with charity. I mean, the more you have, the more, obviously, you have the means to give, and you should give. But this rich man was a miser. And uh, he's obviously a miser. He's not giving. He doesn't give for himself. He had a beautiful house, but he wasn't giving charity. And people knocked on his doors, and they asked, you have money, please give. No, he wouldn't give. This person, like I said, was a miser. And this Sadiq, he's a righteous person, saw this person needs merits. So what happened was that he came in, and he came in with, again, these stories are in old days. Now you come in from the rain, you come from the sidewalk. But those days, they didn't even have sidewalks. It's muddy out. If it's rainy, then it's a lot muddy. You have boots. You know, it's a lot there, uh, dirt, you know, like a dirt room, mud room. But he came in with his dirty, dirty uh, boots. And a you know, person, what are you coming in? I have a beautiful house here, a car, but what are you, crazy? You coming with the boots? And he asked for charity. And this person, the miser, says, all right. He broke down and he asked, he did give this righteous person some money. And that was the one thing he did in his whole lifetime that was very charitable. And uh, the, w the problem was is just that he went up to heaven. And after heaven, everybody's judged. And again, we're scales. We get like a mini judgment uh, every year. Uh, for what we did in the past year, but this is a person who was judged at the end of his lifetime. And he says, well, you didn't do too much. You know, they don't count as merits just because you had a nice horse and a nice house. What did you do for somebody else? How did you help anybody? What good things did you do? So they didn't find too much, but then, on the, you know, I make a joke, they don't have computers. We're probably better computers than we have, to say the least. You know, but they uh, the computer files they found they remembered that he uh, he helped this poor man out and even he was a very righteous man and when he needed help, but just one thing didn't weigh it just didn't weigh it down. One night nice thing is nice, but that's not a whole life compared to a whole lifetime of of not helping people. So that they tell the story, the angels took the mud from the person's boots, you know, dirtied up his carpet which, I mean, is not a mitzvah, but he could have thrown them out, and they threw the mud right onto the scales, and the scales weighed it down, the mud weighed down the scales that he had, a, at least in the side of merit. 
So again, I mean, it's a beautiful, cute story because again, it's, uh, it just tells us quality over quantity. Many times, you know, I know how many people tell me, you know, Rabbi, if I'd be a millionaire, I'd give. I can't give a million dollars, all right, I can't give anything. And that's just not a r correct attitude because again, God does understand. I may have a guy's a million dollars and he's worth a billion dollars. Say, well, what's the big deal? You wrote it off on your taxes anyway. You didn't have any less of a yacht or whatever. You didn't lose anything. And a poor person, when he gives a few dollars, hey man, I could have had a, something a little nicer. I have nothing. And he really is a very hard way to give money. And he gives it. And that two dollars may be more important uh, than the million dollars of somebody else. We just don't know. That's what I'm saying. You cannot judge. Well, what's more important, a million dollars or two dollars? A million dollars. Well, who knows? You know, you have to know the circumstances. You have to know the situation. And therefore, we're not to tell them. We can't tell. You don't know what's in somebody's heart. We surely do not know that. Some people like giving, and other people, it's very hard for them to give. So it's very difficult for them to give, and they give anyway. Well, that's appreciated. That it was harder for that person to give maybe the same amount, but you don't know what's in somebody's heart. You don't know their situation. So for all this, the bottom line that there's it's expressions of the heart that has to be achieved on the new year. And that's a deeper level of to express your soul. Because you have to understand this turn to Kabbalah that every person has a full soul. There's no such thing as a half a soul. Everybody's a hundred percent inside. Trouble is, and it is a trouble, that we're in a physical world and we say we have evil inclinations. Obviously we see a lot of people not doing not nice things to say the least. We don't have to talk about, you know, an unfortunate things. But on the other hand, we don't call them bad people. Their actions are bad, but inside, inner, inner, everybody's perfect. It's a very deep thing to think about. And that's what Kabbalah teaches us, that in, in heart, we're all 100%. And again, I said the last show and listen on Rosh Hashanah and the New Year's, who's, who's going to say I have no faults? I'm perfect. I do everything right. I mean, who could say such a thing? There, this really isn't. Maybe there's a handful of very, very righteous people like the Rebbe. And he wouldn't say it either. He would also say, I have to do more. But I mean, we could say about him, he's a righteous person. But 99.9% .9 of the people, who, you know, who's going to say that they're perfect? That's, it's ridiculous. So on the other hand, in our inner, inner self, we are all perfect. It's in our spiritual selves that are perfect. So what we have to do is express our spiritual selves into the outward realm. We have our mind, we have our heart, and we have our hands. We do things, we think, we speak, we act. That's the way we express ourselves. And sometimes we don't think the right things 100%. We don't say the right things. We don't do the right things. Again, we're not perfect to say the very least. On the other hand, our souls are perfect. And even though that we, the soul was put into our body, was put into this world, I mean, here we are, none to talk about, here we are talking to each other, that in any case that we have to express ourselves in the best possible way, and that's only through our soul. Because our soul is a powerhouse of energy, it's a powerhouse of, of goodness and, and perfection. So what our job then is to do is to, to link up with our soul to try to express our souls as much as we can. And that's the idea, a little bit of chauffeur. One idea. And that to express and to bring out our soul so much so that we're able to express ourselves in, in a good way, in a right way, to make ourselves into a pure way in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to correct ourselves and to feel the spirituality of everything. And once you feel the spirituality of everything, you get to the highest level. And that's a little bit of show for just a little bit, we only have a few minutes, but also I want to get into the idea of Yom Kippur, which is the 10th day of the month, and they do call it the 10 days of repentance. Now, Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year. I said before we fast, I mean, just because we're almost angelic in a certain sense, Angels don't eat, you know, human beings, we need to eat. Well, I mean, 
go with a few days without food, you, you're not going to be around too long. So we're angelic in that sense. Uh, we're trying to be as much as we can. And again, that is really the point, to express ourselves in a spiritual way. And once the spirituality comes flowing through, then I hate to use the word automatic because nothing's so automatic, but at least be a helping hand for us in order to be spiritual and good the way we are supposed to be. Because if you feel this spirituality on Yom Kippur, that'll come through in everything you think and the way you do and you express yourself. And now let's look at Yom Kippur. There are five prayer services on Yom Kippur. Normally there are three. In a normal old day, it's three. On a little bit higher holiness, a lot higher holiness is the Shabbos, Sabbath, and the Yom Tov is the holidays. And on the Suba, there's four. And then on the holiest day of the year, one day a year, it's Yom Kippur. It's the five days of the, the five services on this one day of Yom Kippur. Let's look at that number five. There are five components to our soul. The, in Hebrew, they're called the Nefesh, Ruach, Hayin, Neshama, Yechida. I cannot translate them because um, that there's no English words for five different synonyms for the word soul. It's something only Torah has as deeper levels of feelings for your soul. Five different words for your, the soul, five different levels. And in the Yom Kippur, we reach to the highest level. We reach to the highest level of Yom Kippur through those five prayers that bring us up to the five levels of the soul. So that's a very important idea. Again, expressing your neshama, which it means your soul, expressing your soul. And again, it's not just a chauffeur, and it's not just, okay, well, I'll fast. And, I mean, there is the idea that people are spiritual fasting, but Yom Kippur is a very special day. Again, in Torah, the time frame, the place is important, the time is important, and the person is important, your soul. And that's very, very important. And now just to cue in a little bit about what the time frame is, the Yom Kippur is a special day because that's when Moses came down with the second set of tablets on Yom Kippur. And that achieved full atonement for the golden calf. And that was a time for expressing ourselves to be totally atoned for. And then God says, well, this is just a good day. It's going to be the day of atonement. So certain things happen in the, in the, in the um, spiritual sense in the time frame. And that's very important because, like I say, well, you could blow a show for any old day. Why not? Why can't you blow a horn any old time of the year? And you can fast any old time, you know, take a day off and fast. But you won't achieve that high spiritual effect only on Rosh Hashanah and only on, uh, for the chauffeur and Yom Kippur when we fast on Yom Kippur. Because these are special times in the cycle of the year that are affecting us. So we're the person we were talking about, excuse me, the, 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 the person, that your soul, can't be, I mean, let's say an animal. They don't have the same feelings as a human being. The time, I said, because it's Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, it's the high holidays, a special time. And the third thing is place. Well, truth of the matter is, and that's why uh, we moan we're in exile in the diaspora, the Yom Kippur, the highest level, would be in the temple service. That would be in the base of Mikdash, the temple in Jerusalem. Now people go, it's one of the biggest uh, tourist uh, sites is uh, the Western Wall. But that's all you see is one wall that's left. Everything else is in ruins. It's 2,000 years since uh, it was destroyed, but it, it, the spirituality is still there, and that's why people do go to Israel. They go to Jerusalem, and they go to the Western Wall to achieve that spirituality, to feel their place. Now, of course, I mean, the spirituality is still there, but you say still. I mean, obviously, if you would have the whole temple there and you would go into the place instead of going and standing on the outside looking in, obviously, you can only imagine if people ever felt that spirituality, spirituality of going to Jerusalem. And I know many non-Jews watched his television show. I just wanted to say, I mean, I don't work for the Israeli tourism anyway, but in any case, it is a beautiful place. 
and the majority of tourists are non-Jewish. So that's why I say, and they go there and they see the temple, they read about the temple in Jerusalem, and it's a very big spiritual uplifting spirit, a feeling when you go there. But in any case, the bottom line is you can imagine if you're in the headquarters in the major temple, that's, that's an incredible feeling. So therefore what we have is the place, which we're supposed to be in Jerusalem. Now we're in, the, in any synagogue or any temple. It's something, it's special, it's surely not as special as the, ta- the main temple in Jerusalem. But actually it says in the Talmud, it's a Mikdash Miat, which means it's a small temple. And that's why that the person should feel that they're in a holy place, but obviously feel a little dejected that we're not in the holiest place, which is in Jerusalem. So the way it was really, really set up is that we should have been in Jerusalem, should be, again, we haven't been there for 2,000 years, should be in Jerusalem with the holiest man who is that, even though you say the Jewish people are one, there are conim, there are priests. And in the priests themselves, and nowadays priests say, oh, my name is Cohen, I'm a, I'm a priest. But in, again, 2,000 years ago, in the times of the temple, there was a Cohen Gadol, there was the high priest. And the high priest would be a person that would be able to go into the holy of holies, the holiest place in the temple. In the temple itself is holy, that's why people don't go into the inner sanctum now, even though it's destroyed, but they don't even go on the land. And then they go into the holy uh, place, is only you have to be pure. Then the coning, the priest, could only go into the more inner place where to light the menorah, to, to, uh, to smoke the incense. And then the most holy, holy, it's called Kochi Kedoshin, the holy of holies, that is only one person which is, like I just said, the high priest, on one day of the year, which is Yom Kippur, and he would be able to enter that special place. And it says it's so holy that if he even had one bad thought go through his head, he would immediately die. It's such a holy place. It's so close to God. And what he would do there, he would smoke, put some incense on a fire in a fire pan and smoke it up. But he'd also, obviously, he would pray for a good year, not only for himself, not only for his priests, fellow friends as priests, but also for all the Jewish people. And people would pray for the entire world at that time. And that was a very, very high, big highlight of the the service. Many times I know, unfortunately, people, I always say this, but they think that going to synagogue and praying, oh, yeah, the worst on fasting. It, it really isn't. It shouldn't be in any case. I mean, what people can feel what they want to feel, but they shouldn't feel that way because it should be a most incredible, uplifting spirit by reading the Yom Kippur, the liturgy on Yom Kippur and the High Holidays. It, and if you do read it, and of course it's translated in English, and when most people don't understand the Hebrew, but in any case it's translated in English, and there you will see and you read it, we can't go through it here now. I mean, it would take a long time anyway to read it. It wouldn't be a bad idea to go through with it and show you how beautiful it is. But in any case, it does explain it there, the whole service of the, of the uh, temple, as the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would go into the temple, would totally be pure. And then, very Kabbalistically, very, very deep, there are, there's names of God, Again, just in one minute, just have to edit it down to one minute's idea because, again, I always say it should be, a, let alone a show, it should be a, hours and hours of learning about it. There's different God's names, according to the Kabbalah. And therefore, if you see a Jewish sitter or even a Bible in Hebrew, usually in English you'll only see Lord and God, but if you see a, a Hebrew, you will see different names of God. Not to get into everything here, like I said, it's a whole subject in its own right to say the very least. But in any case, the bottom line, what I want to get to is that on Yom Kippur, they, the Kohen Gadol would express a 72-letter name of God. Now, we don't know what it is today. We lost it. Certain things we lost. And because we're not holy, we're not in the temple. He could only say it to be in the temple in Jerusalem, the 72-letter name of God. And when they would say it, it would be such a spiritual flood, and I do say flood of feelings, that everybody would fall on their face. 
just by hearing it. But in their name, they would be absolved, they would be released from all their sins, and they would be purified. So it's a very, very deep idea of this Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, of course. And um, I told you a little bit of the basic Judaism of what they're all about. But of course, we want to, I mean, basic Judaism, unfortunately, is a lot of people dry. All right, I hear a horn. All right, go to temple. All right, I have to fast on Yom Kippur. Most people do it. A lot of people don't even bother themselves. And that's why the Kabbalah was revealed and is being revealed. And that's why I'm teaching it in order that a person should get to a higher spiritual level of feeling of what this is all about. It is not dry. It is not just old-fashioned. It's not fiddler on the roof tradition. Okay, I'll do it. My grandmother told me always to go to synagogue on the high holidays. Okay, okay. It's, it's deeper than that. There's a deeper expression of what's happening with these mitzvahs. And, and, and not only deeper, it's incredible feelings of ecstasy of, of all the higher on the high holidays it's really getting high on the high holidays person should feel and they should get to our idea that to, 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 to such an extent that they should feel the purity the spirituality of what's really happening and in that sense it's not just the feeling it's just drawing themselves out deeper feelings than you know you had I mean people go to work every day you know you eat you drink you know you exist throughout life, but here to, uh, to really tune into your inner, inner self, and like I said, everybody has it. You'll say, well, I never felt spiritual, I don't feel anything, I don't feel soul. Every person has it, whether it's more expressed, less expressed, sometimes you feel it, that's why certain times of the year, people, Yom Kippur, oh, I gotta go to synagogue, Yom Kippur. Well, like, uh, you know, there are other holidays, I said, just the, the Sabbath, there's other holidays, but why Yom Kippur? Because that's something that's tuned into their soul, that they feel something very, very special. So we should end up with a blessing. It should be a good year, a sweet year, that everything we want, it's a year that should only have blessings and we should see the good seen and revealed. It should be for us. Thank you very much.